Uh, the course that I'm about to present, uh, philosophy uh, at the end of the 20th century, the self under siege, uh, it has been a difficult course for me to develop over the years, and it's been a difficult subject matter for me because uh, I have uh, been uh, trained in the classic tradition of philosophy, studied uh, ancient philosophy. I, I know many of the methods and, and have, have taken all the required logic courses and so on. Uh, I have uh, also d done a lot of work in uh, continental philosophy as well. Uh, it seems to me that the late 20th century presents us with uh, one great and overriding problem, and that will be the, the focus of this course. And uh, I had second thoughts about even calling it a course in philosophy because the most current philosoph philosophical attempts to understand both the self, society, our place in it, and so on, have been what I will call deflationary. Uh, I'll use for an example, I will just mention an article by uh, uh, the philosopher Richard Rorty called The World Well Lost. Uh, this is the upshoot, now remember, of a, of a tradition that's at least 2,500 years old. and it's, now, now that tradition is produced in tiny little articles, uh, four or five page articles in journals that are read by a number of people uh, uh, that's a small enough number that if they were all on a boat and it sank, they would have no readership. And it could be a small boat. It wouldn't, wouldn't need to be the Lusitania. It could be a raft, perhaps. But in any case, Rorty, in, in one of these journals, wrote an article called The World Well Lost and uh, developed a principle that uh, I think has become widespread toward the end of the 20th century concerning philosophy's role in informing us about ourself or about the world. The title itself indicates that the world well lost. Uh, in, uh, Rorty's view is that any uh, problem that's been around for 2,500 years and for which we still don't have a solution, uh, the uh, right response by the, uh, by the uh, contemporary philosopher is, I don't care. And <laughs> the charm of Rorty's answer is it's so American. It's deeply rooted in our culture, and it's in both the anti-intellectualism of our culture, in our fear of eggheads, and so on. And so, in that sense, uh, uh, it has a double significance. I mean, positively, it means that the work of intellectuals has always been separate, uh, separated off from the work of ordinary people. In other words, you have to be freed from the constraints of manual labor. When I was a dishwasher, I didn't have a lot of time to do this. And when I was a union organizer, I didn't have a lot of time to do this. Uh, Any time I was involved in manual labor, I didn't really have the time to do this intellectual work. That separation, that faithful separation between intellectual and manual labor has been with philosophy throughout. Uh, it's rather disappointing, though, to have that tradition, the great tradition of thinking in general, be reduced to, uh, to a comment like, well, gee, I don't care. We, we haven't figured it out. Uh, similarly, let me give you one more example of the profound results of uh, recent contemporary analytic philosophy. The most widely accepted theory of truth is Tarski's theory of truth. Uh, I won't do it justice here, but I will, I think, uh, uh, give you an, an account that fairly summarizes its main insight. Tarski's theory of truth is, uh, it goes something like this. Uh, Tarski says, the, the sentence snow is white, and he puts snow and white in quotation marks, is true if and only if snow is white. Uh, I don't expect anybody in the audience to gasp, if you follow me. This isn't a theory of truth. This is the deflationary remark about how we use the word true. You follow me? It's just, it's just this is not the upshot of, the, of what we thought were the glowing and humanistic accounts that, that I appreciate to this day, developed by Socrates, Aristotle, all the way through Aquinas and so on. And in the late 20th century, what we get in area after area are these, what I will call deflationary accounts. Uh, on the upside, these accounts don't pretend to know much. I mean, that, that's the upside for me. In other words, they're not overly grand. And 
Uh, I have no idea what other courses the teaching company has been offering lately except through the catalog, and I don't want to undermine any of them. But, for example, the uh, substantive attempt to defend God in an intellectual setting where philosophical argument is key has been doomed for so long that that won't be our central attention, although we may mention that as we go by, go through today. Well, why do I start with these rather snotty remarks, if they are snotty? I mean, it may turn out these deflationary things are all we do know, that snow is white if and only if it's white, and, and that if we can't tell whether we're free or determined after 2,000 and something years, then the best attitude to take is I don't really give a damn. I mean, if that turns out to be the right view, we'll, we'll, we'll leave ourselves with that. But there are some problems, and this is going to be the heart of the course, about which a deflationary view is hard to take, and one is our view of ourselves as selves. Our own self-reflective view about what we are as human beings, what is our place in our society, in our world, and more importantly, maybe, what is our place vis-a-vis -vis our commitments, our stations in life, our roles as husbands, wives, fathers, and I guess today to be absolutely correct about everything, significant others, significant other others, dogs and cats, whatever. I mean, you know, just cover the whole gamut here to try to be contemporary. Uh, <clears throat> these are questions about which it's, it's extremely deflationary to go, oh yes, the self, uh, I haven't got one. I mean, that's, that's disappointing in, in a different kind of way. I mean, many of you say sentences that are true without having a theory of truth, I hope, and I mean, I, I, it routinely happens. It happens in pool halls. People say, I can make the eight, and they make it, and you go, that's, that's true. I mean, we, and, but you don't then ask for a theory of truth. Very few of you have a theory of structural grammar or empirical grammar, but most of you don't say sentences like squag bum glock you say sentences like it's raining today and yet it would be kind of silly to ask you for a theory of grammar and again the self is a is a different story with the self the human subject i'm not saying that you'll tell your story whatever your story happens to be to just anyone but it's hard for me to imagine, and perhaps this difficulty in imagining it is just my difficulty in dealing with the world as it is today. It's difficult for me to imagine anyone taking that kind of cavalier attitude about their view of themselves. And I'd like to argue in a strong sense that every one of us has some kind of theory of what we are as a person. Now, by that, I don't mean a, a really highly developed theory like one in uh, quantum mechanics or anything like that. Uh, I may only mean a narrative story, something that connects or attempts to connect the various disconnected episodes in our lives, something that gives us a reason to think we're the same person today that we were yesterday in some important sense, if that sense only means that you've still got the same driver's license. I mean. In some way, we want to have a narrative about our lives, about ourselves. We want them to mean something, in short. And I don't want to go off in this first lecture on a long uh, uh, exegetical uh, set of remarks on this new phrase, which I'm afraid is going to be just a part of pop psychology, the politics of meaning. I don't have any idea what they're talking about, okay? I don't know. This isn't what I'm... What I'm talking about is something much more immediate. And it may, in fact, have political implications. By that, I mean it may mean that people can have refrigerators, nice cars, nice homes, nice children, and nice degrees, and, you know, nice friends, and have absolutely no sense of who the hell they are, and be in utter despair. In fact, uh, that condition, on the account I'll be giving, will be structurally common. This is not a, like a slam on any people who are personally here in the audience today or any people viewing me. It's not a personal remark. It's a structural condition. This, and so, therefore, the title, The Self Under Siege. And, uh,